Good morning. Good morning. Let's, uh, we are about to get started here. Uh, we can begin gathering here as we are going to uh, continue our study of attributes of God. Today our subject is God's mercy. And so God's mercy is a, a, a deep subject. It's a subject that obviously that touches all of us um, daily, but certainly at one part in our, at one time of our lives. It is because of God's mercy that um, that He He turned He uh, revealed His Son to us. Uh, he had changed our direction, um, and that uh, the effects of that were not just uh, temporal, you know, in our lives to, uh, as we live them, but also, and more importantly, uh, eternally, and in the life that He gives us through Christ. So, before we get started, uh, so I'm excited about uh, about this study. It was a, it was a blessing to to. Uh, to put it together and to uh, and to be as always reminded of, of these attributes and certainly of God's mercy uh, in, in my life and, and certainly in those those whom I know. So before we get started, let's go to the Lord in prayer that He would bless our time together, that He would make this uh, a, a profitable time for us in learning about Him. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you. Uh, we thank you. And we praise you for the day that you've given us. We thank you for gathering us together, Lord, uh, individually, Lord, and then as a church, as you've gathered us, a body of believers, Lord, um, that uh, to bring honor and glory to you and that we would, um, again, that you would show us our love um, in saving us, Lord, and, and bringing us um, into the family, Lord, and into the body of Christ. And so um, we thank you for that. I ask that you would uh, be with us uh, this, this morning. Give us ears to hear, um, uh, stir our hearts, Lord, to the things that we hear, that we would, uh, we would not just listen to gain knowledge, Lord, but we would, we would uh, be stirred to action, uh, stirred to reflection, uh, stirred to prayer and, and thankfulness, and also as, a, as we uh, understand and, and consider uh, the effects of your mercy on us, Lord, and how we should respond to that. So uh, we thank you, we pray, praise you for the time that you give us. All right, well, mercy, last week we talked about, Brother David brought the study on, on, on uh, grace, and the uh, handouts are on the back row. If nobody has them or somebody can pass them out, I was able to get uh, quite a few of them done before the copier tried to eat the original, so uh, I was able to save it and pull it out of the jaws of death there, but, uh, so we can make more if, uh, if we need to, but last week Pastor David talked about God's grace, and, and we often hear mercy and grace used, used together. They seem to be uh, somewhat inseparable, and so one could say they're, you know, they're two sides of the same coin, but nevertheless, they are different from each other, and, uh, and so some of the things that we learned last week, uh, we'll, 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 see, we'll see that in comparison to what we learned today about God's mercy. So, you know, grace is a gift. We think about grace, we think about a gift, right? Uh, it means uh, uh, it's a, something we don't deserve. Uh, mercy, on the other hand, is not getting the punishment we do deserve. Uh, and in, in mercy, God shows his pity, his compassion, his love, and his kindness towards people. So that's kind of what we, uh, from a definitional standpoint. Uh, but, you know, before we just, you know, dive in and look at at verses that look and, and see examples of God's mercy, we really need to uh, answer or ask ourselves two questions. Number one is, who is able to give mercy, right? Who, who, is, who is able, who's authorized, who's, who has the authority to give mercy uh, in, in terms of what we're talking about here? And then the second question we would ask ourselves is, why? Why do we need mercy? What, what's What's so? What's the big deal about mercy that that, that it's so important that we study it? So we need to understand that as a foundation, as foundational truths before we go on and just look at examples of God's mercy without having the perspective or the understanding of what they're what they're tied to, and how the importance that God's mercy has has had on His people, uh, from when He first gathered them all the way through through us and and to uh, till His return and to His promises. So. Let's look at that first question, God's authority to be merciful. That's kind of how we're going to break today's study up. We're going to look at his authority. Uh, we're going to see why mercy is needed. Uh, we're going to look at how God's mercy was applied in the Old Testament uh, to his people. 
uh, and see some uh, correlation there and some, some foreshadowing to how God applies his mercy to the believer in the New Testament. Uh, and then what should be our response to God's mercy? And, uh, and then we'll just we'll wrap it up at that point. So um, a few, few items to go through here, so hopefully they'll all tie together. So we'll start with God's authority to be merciful. Why, you know, why God? Why does, why does God, why do we say or why do we attribute this attribute of merciful, mercy upon God? Well, Colossians 1.18 tells us this. It says, for, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. All right, so, and this is, you know, so, so foundational truth, right? God created all things, right? All things are created, uh, you know, from the phys physical things that we see, from the structure, from the government, from, from, the, from the rulers, authorities, all these things, thrones, you know, everything go through, goes through the Lord. He's established them. Um, he wills them uh, according to his sovereign purpose. And so he is the ultimate authority, the ultimate ruler, right? So we're talking about authority here. Uh, and then, so we understand that he has the position, right? The, the position to have, to have authority, but what kind of ruler is he? Uh, is he a good ruler? Uh, or is he a bad ruler? So, you know, we we'll look at First at John chapter 1, verse 5, tells us this. This is the message we have he heard from him who proclaim you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So we have a God that is perfectly righteous. There's no darkness. There's no evil. Um, he is a good ruler. He is a good judge. He is a just judge. He's a merciful judge, right? He's a, he has omniscience. He has, he's all, all powerful as well. Um, he, he is everywhere. So this, this positions, you know, God as that, as the perfect judge. And so that this idea of compassion and mercy, uh, really can only be shown by someone who has the power or the right to, to punish or to harm someone. And so it's the ability to relieve somebody of due suffering. So kind of the example here would be if I was in a court of um, a court of law at, on the day of, of sentencing, uh, and there's a there's a there's a uh, someone who has been found guilty, right? Uh, an inmate found guilty. The judge is sitting on the bench, and the judge pronounces, you know, the death sentence upon this person. Well, I can stand up in court and say, I pronounce you guilt, uh, innocent, and I think you should be set free. But, you know, what of what good would that do, <laughs> right? No, they would they would haul me out of the out of the courtroom. Uh, but because I have no authority, I have no authority in, in that court per se, uh, or within the structure of the, of the legal process. However, if the judge or the presiding judge who has been appointed to that bench were to make that, that, uh, that, that sentence, that declaration of, of commuting a sentence or whatever, then, then that's what would happen. Uh, it certainly would happen, it, and that that prisoner or that per, that guilty person or whatever would would uh, would be able to go through the process to be freed because it is within the judge's authority. So we understand then that uh, that in that respect, this is what we're talking about when we say that God has the authority. Uh, there must be an ability, not just a want to, but there has to be an ability to show mercy, uh, and that's what our Lord has. Psalm 116, verse 5 tells us this. It says, gracious is the Lord and righteous. Our God is merciful. So this is speaking to his love, to his compassion uh, for his people. In, in Exodus uh, chapter 34, verse 6 and 7 tells us this. It says, the Lord passed before him, talk, speaking of, of uh, the Lord and his interaction uh, with Moses, as the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving inequ inequity and transgression and sin, but who, who will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the children's children on to the third and fourth generation. So the idea that we pull from this, understanding that you know, we have a Lord, uh, a God who is merciful, he's gracious, slow to anger, right? He is, is steadfast, love, uh, long-suffering, um, 
nonetheless, um, that will not clear the guilty, uh, will not overlook sin, will not, uh, you know, he will be just, a just God who has mercy uh, when he uh, chooses to have mercy. And so, you know, we understand then that, uh, you know, through this, we see we see these attributes of the Lord. And we, we studied some of these. Um, and so just to get, a, get an idea of, of the, the God that we serve. Jonathan Edwards said this, he says, God is pleased to show mercy to his enemies according to his own sovereign pleasure. Though he is infinitely above all and stands in need of no in, and stands in no need of creatures, yet he graciously pleased to take a merciful notice of poor worms in the dust. Right? So, you know, just again, perspective, perspective of who we are as sinners in relation to God in terms of our power, our standing, um, our abilities, uh, you know, we're, we're just worms in the dust, according to John, Jonathan Edwards, and that's a, that's a, great, uh, a great perspective, right? You know, as, as we walk along and, and you see a little ant or a little bug on the ground and you, you know, you just consider what you could do to it, you know, just how you tower over it, how little it is compared to how it can harm you uh, or not harm you, um, just that, that, in our mind, we can see that, that relationship, yet this is what, uh, what we're being uh, shown in Scripture uh, between our, our, our position and position of the Lord. So, God is merciful. He is, has the authority to be merciful, and he is good. So that's our first, uh, our first foundational truth before we talk directly about his mercy. But the second question is, is more, more to the heart of, of our situation is why is mercy needed, right? Why, why are we in need of mercy? And so in order to fully grasp the importance of God's mercy, it requires that we have an understanding of the magnitude and the consequence of, of original sin. And that is its own, that can be its own study for sure, but you know, we're just gonna touch on it here. We need to understand uh, the consequences of, of the sin. Um, and some people would make light, right, of, of, the, of the account in Genesis about the account of Adam and Eve and their transgression against God, right? Some would say, I don't know why God got so mad just because they ate an apple or, you know, make some kind of a, of, of a lighthearted uh, suggestion there. But that really just underscores uh, really a, a lack of understanding, a lack of, of, of understanding what we just talked about, the difference between us and God. Uh, we are not God, yet we seek to be God, and that's what that was what the transgression was in not believing the words that the Lord had instruction that the Lord had, had told them about about the tree, and it's it's this is the equivalent or it's not the equivalent, but for us in our minds, you know, it's not just disobeying an order. It's trying to be the the, the chief, right? This is not a this is like the. Uh, uh, the sailor, the deckhand on a ship, right, trying to storm the, the captain's office and take, take control of the ship, to be the captain and guide the ship and make the, make the decisions. This is the private on the front line, you know, running back and, and, and trying to overpower the general, right, that has the battle plans and has the, has the, the plan for all of the, of the operation. This is that level of trying to take over the headship or the, the leadership and, and assume the power, assume the significance in the position of of the one that has already been placed over you and so we know that in both of those situations you know in a military uh in a military uh type of situation you know those things will get you they'll get you in trouble they'll get you they'll get you sent to the to the whatever the brig or the jail or whatever you want to call it but um, um and they'll get you kicked out and they'll get you in a lot of trouble so we see that in in our in our society in our uh structure how how big a deal that is un uh, understood when somebody tries to do a, you know, tries to take over. So yes, this is what ha this is what's happening. Uh, R.C. Sproul said it was cosmic treason, treason against the you know creator of the universe. Uh, it is not insignificant, but it also had a, a deep effect not only on on the on the children and on the generations to pers uh, to come after uh, Adam and Eve, and so. Original sin then can be dis defined as a moral corruption we possess as a consequence of Adam's sin, resulting in a sinful disposition manifesting itself in habitually sinful behavior. 
Okay, a lot of words there put together, but basically it, it affects us from the inside out, right? It, it takes us from not from a neutral state to say, I can choose, I can choose good and I can choose bad. I, I'm able to. We have a natural bent to the bad, to the, to the sinful desires. And it affects not just our actions, but it affects our thoughts. It, it, it affects our motivations, our behavior. Um, it, is, it is through and through us. And that is, that is the effect. That is what drives us from God and, and what puts us in that position of needing mercy. Uh, Romans uh, 5.12 says this. It says, therefore, just as sin came through the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sin. So we see because of that original sin that we have death coming into the world, death being then passed on to um, uh, to each person um, because we all sin. We all fall short of the glory of God. And that spiritual death, that separation from God, that is what, uh, and that uh, turning uh, not from uh, walking with him, but uh, being his enemy uh, and being incurring his wrath. So that is what it does to us. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 21, uh, the first part, uh, verse 21. For as by man, for as by a man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. So again, talking about the effect now, the the, the con contrast between the uh, what effect Adam's actions had on mankind versus the effect of what Christ has done for mankind. Uh, we'll get deeper into that for sure. Um, but this this uh, disposition, or or as the uh, as is said here in this uh, definition, this uh, habitually sinful behavior, you know, R.C. Sproul referred to it as radical corruption. He, he said he liked that, that term better. He says because it really does, you know, the term total depravity, kind of, your mind kind of goes to, well, you know, that we're as bad as we could possibly be, right? We're some kind of raving lunatics and, you know, just, uh, you know, but that's not what it is. That's, that's, that's a picture of, of, uh, of actions but we have to understand that that depravity is inside of us. It is it's corruption of 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 the flesh and and, and of that sin. So um, it's it's not something we see. It's something we carry uh, inside of us. Uh, Jeremiah chapter in chapter seventeen verse nine said this about the heart. He said the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? Right. The heart. You know, being our that's the heart of our motiv our motivation. That is our of what drives our actions, uh, and it's sick, right? It's deceitful. It lies to us. It, it doesn't seek the truth, um, and so that is the state we find ourselves in. So being in that state, right, uh, by having that sin nature, uh, not only are we sinners or do, or do we have sin, but there's a guilt that comes from that, right? We've incurred a guilt before God, and we deserve punishment for that guilt. So we don't stand as a, as a, as morally neutral or neutral in, in, in terms of God's eyes, but in God's eyes, but we stand as condemned, right? Condemned and dead, uh, destined for God's wrath. So again, circling back to talking about God's mercy and why mer God's mercy is important for us, it's because we're in need of mercy. Uh, whether we know it or not, whether it's been revealed to us or not, uh, it, is, it is what the scripture says, the state that we're in. Like what the London Baptist Confession of Faith, chapter 6, paragraph 3, says about this. It says, it kind of sums up the effects of original sin and, and, uh, and, and how, it, how it affects us. It says this, by God's appointment, right, didn't happen, this did nothing happened outside of God's, God's sovereign purpose, right, or his understanding. So we, so we understand that. We didn't catch God by surprise uh, or any arguments to that effect that somehow it was, you know, uh, out of his control. So that, you know, all these words mean something, so we won't uh, stick too much to all, the, all of them, but just let's read it for the totality of what it says here. It says, by God's appointment, they were the root and the representatives of the whole human race. Because of this, the guilt of their sin was accounted and their corrupt nature passed on to all their offspring who descended from them by ordinary procreation. Their descendants are now conceived in sin, and they are by nature children of wrath, servants of sin, and partakers of death, and all other miseries, spiritual, temporal, and eternal, 
unless the Lord Jesus sets them free. So that's what the, what the writers of the confession, how they summed up these scriptures and these different scriptures that talked about the different uh, the effects of, of sin uh, on the person and also the consequence of sin in God's eyes, right? Children of wrath, servants of sin, partakers of death. Not a good, not something we would put on a, on a card, right? So this is not a, not a good description uh, of ourselves. And yet, and then we also see that there is guilt being accounted to, accounted, right? So we're talking about a, like a financial ledger, right? We have a guilt that is accounted to, and who will, who will rid us of this debt? How do we get out of this debt? Um, and so that's, that's a question. That's the question that we have. That's the question we should have. And, you know, when we, you know, when, when there's evangelism taking place, you know, it's always the good, the good step is to understand, you know, before going into the, to the God, what is the gospel? The good news is to understand where does the person stand as they, as they are right now? What is the bad news? And the bad news is we have a debt that we've incurred because of our sin and uh, we're not able to pay it off. We're, we're, uh, we're trapped. We're slaves to that debt. Um, so this is what we're going to be looking at here. Just some of, the, uh, some of the verses that will be pulled into this uh, definition here. Ephesians chapter 2, the second half of verse 3 says this. And speaking of, of the people, of the, of the believers, but you know, whom, whom uh, were saved, it says they were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Again, children of wrath. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 10 says this. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, and much more, now that we are reconciled, shall be saved by his life. So we talk about reconciled, again, another term, financial term, that we would understand reconciling an account makes to be, to be made even. Um, who, can re- who can reconcile that debt that we have? And it's through Christ. Uh, but again... We're not just made even. That's the mercy piece of it. But the grace, obviously, is that he then gives us eternal life through, through Christ. Um, again, two sides of the same coin often linked together, uh, certainly for us. So, uh, you know, to kind of summed up, you know, probably heard this before. Uh, it's true, and it's really, it's, but it really goes to the heart of, of what we're saying here. You know, we're not sinners because we've sinned. It's not, we're not tainted because of an act that we've done, but we sin because inherently we're sinners, right? We have that, that, that bent towards, towards sin. Uh, and it's not caused by external effects of others, right? As we would try to point out, we would always try to look at others, you know, you know going back to, back to Adam, right? This woman you gave me, I had, you know, to ourselves. Well, I was put in a bad situation. I was, you know, uh, my, my environment, my circumstance. I didn't have a better choice. Uh, you know, but that's not that's not what the uh, the reason we weren't forced to do it. We weren't, uh, you know, but it is because of an, a defect, a defect of our nature. It's internal, as Jeremiah said, it is from the heart, uh, and then it manifests manifests itself outwardly uh, in, as sin. So that's the place we start out at. So that now we can start the study. <laughs> so from, yeah, that's just the intro. So let's look at mercy. So we talked about, as we started off here, we talked about the sin, the original sin of of, uh, Adam and Eve. And we see immediately uh, that in the aftermath of their transgression, in the midst of their shame, right, as they come to see what they've done, the Lord extends mercy in place of wrath and destruction, which he would have been uh, fully justified to do, right? He He could have got rid of them, right? He could have destroyed them. Uh, But yet he extends uh, mercy and grace and he covers their shame. Genesis uh, chapter 3, verse 21 says this, And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Right? So he, he you know, when they see their nakedness, they see their, sh- their shame in that, he, he addresses that, he clothes them. Um, and in the way that he clo- clothes them, there's also a, a, a great foreshadowing for us, right? By the skins of an animal, right? An animal shed blood. Uh, in order for the for them to be covered, so that there would there was going to have to be a price paid uh, for that for that covering of sin. Um, so we see that you know that's a you know, the mercy is that he didn't destroy them, right? The grace is that he clothed them, you know. So again, we see the, we see these two things, you know, that he that he extended them something to them that they didn't that they didn't deserve, which was the clothing, but also withheld judgment and wrath that they did deserve, which was you know. The, the, what they had surely coming to them for their transgression. 
So we see that, and we see, then we see as we travel down in, uh, through, through scriptures, and we get into the book of Exodus, now we see the Lord instituting a, a, uh, uh, a process or, or, of, uh, of uh, sacrificial uh, process, right, of sacrifices in order to keep his people that he has, that he has uh, uh, set apart to keep to absolve their sins, to keep them to be able to still be close to a perfect uh, and unsin sinless God, right? So there is a system of of, uh, of sacrifices put in, and so we see then about we learn about a mercy seat, and we may have heard this term. The mercy seat was the cover was the cover of the Ark of the Covenant, right? It was located in the tabernacle in the center uh, of it, uh, in the most holy place, and and God gives instructions to Moses about this. This seat, this mercy seat, and it's a, uh, you know, it's a, uh, it was there were cherubim, uh, you know, on either side, uh, out of uh, most of it was made out of gold. I would go into depth of it, but uh, you know, this is a, a picture of a of a seat here, right? And so, in Exodus chapter twenty five, verse twenty two, it says this, speaking to him, it says, "There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim, that are." on the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the people of Israel. So this is a meeting place for God, between God and the mediator, right? The priest that, that would be uh, there. Um, and so it was upon that seat, that mercy seat, that the high priest would, would sprinkle the blood of a bull first for his sin, right? He had to, he had to make a, a, a sacrifice or an atonement for his sin just to be in the presence and then he would take um, uh, a, the sins of a goat, and that would be for the, uh, and sprinkle it on the seat, and that would be for the sins of the people, for the people of Israel. Uh, again, a repeating process, right? This was a yearly uh, event that had to, be, had to be done. So, you know, we see God's mercy in providing this system uh, to Moses so that the people could remain uh, close to him, and he could he could remain within, amongst his people. So that's a mercy, right? Because he he didn't have to do that. Um, you know, they could have he could have uh, forsaken them, but yet he provided a way. And so in Leviticus chapter sixteen, we see this. Uh, you know, the, the description of this in in verses fourteen and fifteen. Uh, it says, and he shall take, speaking of the of the high priest, and he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. All right. So this was a, this was a, a, an act of atonement for the people uh, yearly that had to be repeated. And so we're going to see then how that mercy seat, right, the idea of the mercy seat, how that, again, is also a foreshadowing of what the final uh, uh, atonement would look like in, in Christ. Uh, but before we get to that, let's just see some others as we look in the Old Testament again of how God dealt and how God, how God dealt mercifully with his people. We see his mercy upon Solomon. Uh, you know, after he turned from the Lord, uh, you know, and followed the, the, the pagan gods of his wives, built them uh, high places, right, uh, uh, temples and, and places to worship these, these pagan gods that were an abomination to, to the Lord. Um, so he, he definitely turned. And this was after, after scripture said, you know, God had revealed himself to Solomon uh, multiple times, and yet he turned. Uh, and so one would think that uh, you know God was would be fairly would be fully just to uh, to just you know, destroy Solomon and, and certainly uh, take the kingdom from him at that point and and change things. But we see in First Kings chapter eleven, uh, verses eleven through thirteen, we see how God deals with them and has mercy. And, and uh, so let's take note of this. It says, Therefore, the Lord said to Solomon, since this has been your practice. And you, do, and you do not have, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes that I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you. Okay, so there's the judgment, right? It's a, there's a judgment. I will surely tear the kingdom from you. 
and will give it to your servant. Verse 12, there's mercy. Yet for the sake of David, your father, I will not do it in your days, but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. Verse 13, however, there's another mercy. I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son for the sake of David, my servant, and for the sake of Jerusalem that I have chosen. Right, so in, even in Solomon's unfaithfulness to God, you know, God is faithful to himself. He's faithful to his covenant. Uh, he's faithful to the love and the promises that he made to David. And he, you know, he's, he, he tempers his judgment at that time to Solomon. Uh, and it doesn't, again, doesn't overlook or, or forget the sin or, or allow it to pass. But he just, but he does because of his love and because of his uh, faithfulness to his uh, uh, covenants, you know, uh, tempers his, his judgment there and uh, to a later date. And then he will exact his judgment, uh, but it will not be a total judgment. Again, another mercy is that he doesn't, he's not going to do away with the entire, with all of the nation, but uh, there will be a remnant there, right? One tribe for his son. So we also see God being merciful to Israel while Israel is in captivity, right? You know, why are they in captivity, right? They have, they have turned from the Lord. They have followed other gods. And so, over, and so God has turned them over to their enemy. He's raised up, he's raised up other nations to uh, discipline his people and, uh, and, dis- and, and disperse them. And so through the hand of these adversaries, uh, you know, uh, they, come, they eventually come to their repentance confess their sin to the Lord and this is what the Lord has has told them you know we see this in in Psalm in the Psalms uh, chapter 106 verse 45 says this for their sake he remembered his covenant and relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love we saw that the that the um, one of the definitions of mercy right is is compassion love kindness towards people towards his people uh, so we see that uh, he relented according to the abundance of his steadfast love. Nehemiah uh, chapter nine verse thirty one says this: Nevertheless, in your great mercies, you did not make an end for them or forsake them. You are a gracious and merciful God. Again, um, making an end of them would have been the righteous judgment, and he would have been fully. Um, Justified to do that, yet he shows his mercy to his people, uh, and and he does not forsake them uh, because of his graciousness and his mercifulness. So, and then finally, uh, in Old Testament, we'll look at this one. This is one you know, uh, this has been a favorite topic here for the last couple of weeks uh, because Pastor preached as we were preaching through Second uh, Samuel. We talked about uh, uh, David's uh, uh, treatment of Mephibosheth. Right, and then Pastor David talked about it last week. Also, when we looked, he looked at the grace uh, uh, side of it. So, just kind of as a recap, right? Um, you know, David uh, he was merciful to Saul. Right, Saul was his was his sworn enemy. Right, Ch- chased him for for years. Really, uh, e- even though David was was faithful to him uh, every chance he had. And so, here's a servant of of of, of Saul that's left. Right, Mephibosheth. And so he summoned, uh, David summons him uh, to, uh, to the uh, palace or to, to, to see him. And so surely what would be the, the expectation? The expectation was, man, this is not good. This is probably going to be the end of me. Uh, this would be what Mephibosheth would, would have been thinking. I'm the last representation of his, enemy, of his sworn enemy. Certainly he wants to, to do away with me. Instead, David extends grace uh, and mercy uh, to that, to his, uh, to the servant of his longtime adversary. Um, so none was expected, none was deserved uh, for 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 this fellow. And yet, Second uh, Samuel chapter nine verse seven says this: it "says And David said to him, Do not fear, for I will show you kindness for the sake of your father Jonathan, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul your father, and you shall eat at my table always." Right. So the the mercy, right, and the kindness there is that he didn't kill him. He didn't, he didn't get rid of him. But in, in, And then, connected to that, is this grace that he ex, uh, extends to him to restore the land to, uh, uh, of his father to him 
and then to, he would be at his table. So in other words, he would be welcome. He would be part of the, of the kingdom. He would not be an outsider. He would be part of the kingdom. He would be welcome. Uh, and so that's a, you know, where he went in expecting, expecting to be done away with uh, because he understood his guilt by association uh, with Saul. You know, here he, has a, he, he gets what he doesn't deserve, doesn't expect, and more. Right, he gets more than he could have expected. So, again, a a, um, a foreshadowing, a an example through David in David's actions of what Christ does for the sinner. Right, gives them not what they deserve, but gives them that and more. Right, and in, in what we receive through Christ. So, up to now, any comments, questions? So we've talked about God's authority to be merciful. Um, we've talked about our need for mercy. And we've talked about examples of God's mercifulness in the Old Testament as he dealt with his people. Uh, now we're going to look at uh, mercy for the believer, right? As we see it in the New Testament, as we experience it in our lives. Um, let's look at that. So there's a tie, there's a connection, obviously. Uh, the Greek word for mercy seat, which we spoke of earlier, um, translated from the Old Testament uh, into uh, a word that we will understand as propitiation. Propitiation. Never have been able to say that word very well, but <laughs> anyway. Um, so what is it? It's a, it's a two-part act. It involves appeasing the wrath of an offended person, right? You're, you're appeasing the wrath, and then being reconciled to him. So it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's coming together, but not just not just being forgiven or appeasing that wrath, but then being joined together, right? Reconciling. Um, in God's merciful kindness, his patience and long-suffering, he takes the dead sinner and gives them a new life, raising them from the grave, that spiritual death that they incurred uh, through Adam, and, and gives them eternal life uh, through Christ. Romans chapter 3, verses 23 to 25 Tell us about this. And it says this, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Again, this is where we're at. This is what we've established. Verse 24, and all are justified by his grace as a gift. So we see the grace part, right? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. So that propitiation by the blood of Christ, right, as we see the mercy seat, the connection uh, to that, uh, that, that he, yes, there is grace. There is grace that was given to us a gift that we are redeemed, right? That account is, that debt is, is accounted for. But it comes at a cost. It, it, it comes at a real cost of appeasing or dealing with God's wrath. It must be dealt with. It must be, that wrath must be uh, uh, taken care of. And that's done through, through blood, through the blood of Christ. And so we see the connection there, how, how Christ then, then is that final once and for all offering, sin offering, right, for his people. Uh, and it's his blood, the shedding of his blood, not the continual shedding of the animals uh, yearly and daily, but once and for all, he is our, uh, our good and, and perfect sacrifice uh, that redeems us. So then the, the next idea we want to understand is that reconciliation to God, that, that gift of grace, it's not by the work of, of the sinner, right? Uh, we're not, uh, it's, it's nothing that we do, it's not through our works, it's nothing, nothing that we uh, deserve or somehow talk God into, but it's surely by and only by the compassion of God's compassion for the sinner. First John 4.10 says this, that in this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be, a, to be the propitiation for our sins. Right? So it's not that we were somehow able to deal with that debt or, or, or reconcile it, but it's through the blood of Christ that, that we were uh, for our sin that he loved us. It's because of God's love for us. Because, again, in our natural state, we don't love God. We are his enemies. We, we face his wrath. Uh, we turn from him. We run from him. We, we challenge him um, and seek to replace him. So it wasn't out of love that we had, but a love he had for, for us. 
And so we, we want to see that for the perspective that it gives us and the truth, uh, you know, of God's word. So Ephesians chapter 2, uh, verse 4 and 5 is, is, is really good. Uh, another good uh, example in scripture of the, the role of God, right? The role of God in the life of the sinner. Um, and without getting to, to all of that passage, but if, you know, if we read from, from verse 1 through verse 10 where he talks about, you know, we've, we're saved not by grace, uh, but for, for good works um, that he has prepared uh, for us. But right in the middle of that verse, you know, as he, as he starts off by describing just the, the wretched state of the sinner and, and, and goes through an explanation of all of our, the attributes of the sinner, right, which are long and many and, and bad. Uh, but right in the middle of that verse, he says, he gives us the reason of why there's a difference, why we're no longer in that state. And so Paul tells of the mercy that God extends to the people who deserved only wrath and judgment. So Ephesians 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, again, echoing what we, what we see in 1 John, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. He goes on from there. But again, it's that, there's that turning point, right, in, in the life of the believer because of, because of the mercy of God, not because of the work that the, that the sinner does. Hope for the hopeless, you know, life for the dead, according to the mercy found in Christ. And so for this, you know, we should be, we should be thankful, right? We should be uh, thankful for God's, God's mercy in our lives. First Peter says this, First Peter verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 3 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. So it's that living hope that he gives us, uh, not the hopeless state that, we, that the sinner finds himself in um, or will see himself in, if, even if he doesn't recognize it in this life, uh, it will eventually be shown to him. Uh, the hopeless state that he is in as an enemy of God. So, so then uh, we'll leave it there with uh, Titus. Uh, again, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 says this, He saved us, not because of the works done, done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So again, the, the point is if we... Uh, I'm trying to drive home here is just the fact that, you know, it's not by works done for us, but for it to be a mercy, it, it, you know, it comes from God. It's only something that he can extend to us. We don't, we don't earn it. Brings us to our, our last point here um, would be what would be then with these truths, with these understandings of where we, where we stand without Christ uh, as we look at um, the mercy that God does extend to us. Um, what should be our response? What, you know, what, what's our call to action here, right, um, in, in this study as we, as we learn about God's mercy, about his attributes? Um, so for the believer, right, for those that have been called uh, to faith, uh, we should be a reflection of that mercy uh, that we've been shown, right? We're to be, we're to be conformed into the image of Christ. We're to be as a, a mirror, an image uh, of, of that Christ-like love and mercy, uh, Luke uh, chapter 6 verse 36 says this be merciful even as your father is merciful right? it's a command be merciful even as your father is merciful again we, it reminds us of where that mercy comes from James chapter 2 verse 13 tells us this says, for judgment is without mercy to one who has shown no mercy read that again for judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy Mercy triumphs, triumphs over judgment. Right, so we don't want to find ourselves in a position where, where we have not extended mercy. Uh, there's a great uh, price to pay for that. And it brings us to an example that Christ gave us uh, in Matthew uh, chapter 18, verse 23 to 25. This is the parable of the, of the unforgiving servant. Um, and so the, the thought here, the, the, the understanding is we, we must not forget the depth of our the depth and de of our debt and the infinite magnitude of God's mercy, right? And so in this parable, it's, um, we'll just read through it here. Um, it's kind of broken into three pieces here. First, there's going to be an interaction between a servant and his master. Then we're going to see 
the reaction of what that servant does once he leaves his master, and then we're going to see the, the consequence for how for his actions uh, before again brought back to the master. Uh, so the first section says this as Christ is telling us this parable. Uh, Matthew 18, verse 23 to 35 said this. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the, so the servant fell to his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of the pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt or the debt. So mercy, mercy extended right to the servant where none was expected or, or earned, a debt that could not be paid that was forgiven, right, w wiped out. Verse 28, the next section. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. So we see no, no mercy extended right by this, by this servant. And now he's reported uh, to the master who summon him, summons him back. In verse 32, then his master summoned him and said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should, I, and should, not, you have to ha and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. Verse 35, so also my heavenly father will do to you every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Again, this mercy, the idea of extending mercy, of having forgiveness, uh, this is something that we, um, we exercise in our life. We have opportunities for this in our life, with, whether it be uh, friends, family members, um, acquaintances, any time that we are um, seemingly, uh, in our minds, wrong, right? And we, we seek justice or, or, or our, our form of vengeance against someone. Uh, we are to remember that mercy that we've been shown. And so this is something that we, you know, all of us, all of us face this, right? We face this in the morning just driving to church, so much less uh, in our interactions with our children or with our spouses. And so uh, something to consider, something to take to heart and understand uh, Christ's uh, uh, use of this parable uh, to show us uh, that that mercy uh, that was extended to us is great and that we are to, to show that mercy as well. The believers to seek God's mercy in repentance and humble obedience through prayer. Uh, and so Hebrews uh, chapter 4 verse 16 says this, Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Uh, it's a beautiful picture, right, of drawing, drawing close to the throne. And, and, and this idea of drawing close with confidence is, is really a, there's, there's depth to that understanding, right? Because we, as we look back, as we talked earlier, the high priest had to make atonement for his sin before he could even approach, approach the, uh, the, the mercy seat uh, in the tabernacle. Um, and, you know, there, it, was, it was a touch and go thing, right? If they did, they did the wrong move, if they did the wrong uh, sacrifice, did a, a, an unauthorized sacrifice, they would be consumed. So they, they didn't go into that mercy seat with, you know, full bore head, right, confidence, hey, I got this. They were very careful. They were very careful to follow God's commandment. So the fact that we are able to draw uh, to the Lord and to the throne of grace with confidence, again, because our sins have been covered uh, by Christ, um, it, it, is, it is only through Christ that we are able to approach the Father, um, and it's through, because, uh, you know, and it is, it is him who, who bears the veil, right, makes, makes the way for us to come to, come to the Father. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 and 10 says this, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
So if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. All right, so this is not a, this is not a, a works then we get something, but this is, it's, it's speaking to the effect of being, being having the spirit, uh, being saved, that if, if we are his, if we, are, if we do belong to him, this will be our actions. We will not claim to not have sinned, right? Um, and we will come to him and confess our sins. That our, the life of the believer should be a life of repentance, a life, a life of prayer and confession, confessing our sin. And if we don't have those, those traits, if we don't show those, uh, those actions, then, you know, that we really need to, to, to pray and consider and, 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 and come to the Lord and ask about our state, right? Because, you know, the Lord's saying here that, that uh, his word's not in us, right? So, so again, the, you know, we need to take that seriously. Uh, if there's a pattern there, we need to, we need to stop and, and examine ourselves, right? And so, um, so that's for, uh, something for us to consider. So that's what the, for the believer, right? For, for the unbeliever, for those that have not been called uh, and not been uh, shown Christ, uh, you know, then, then for them, you know, they need to confess their sin to the Father, uh, repent or turn from their sin, uh, place their trust or the direction of their life uh, in the mercy of the Lord uh, through the faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. Mark uh, chapter 1, verse 14 and 15 says this. It says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so the time for you is, is at hand. Uh, the, the message of Christ has been presented uh, and scripture is clear on what we must do. And so that we should, uh, that's what we're commanded to do. And so I pray that uh, through the study, through the, through the scripture, uh, and the commands of Christ are clear uh, to all who hear. Um, so we'll wrap it up here. So the Old and New Testaments are united in their affirmation that the God of the Bible is merciful and compassionate. He's a compassionate God. He's a merciful God. He's long, has love for us, for his people. And that fullest ex expression uh, we've seen examples in the Old Testament. We, we saw types and shadows of what the, the, the fullest expression of that mercy is. But that mercy, the fullest ex expression is found in Christ and the person and work of Jesus and the, the compassion of the incarnate God uh, who came, came to earth to, to live a sinless life, to be um, offered up as a, as a ransom sacrifice and who was resurrected uh, from the dead you know, showing that he had victory over death itself. And so he now is seated at the right hand of the Father, and uh, he is uh, commanding us um, and giving us um, the instruction of his gospel and of the truth and the, the, the truth and the promise that it has. First Thess Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9 says this, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's that's our prayer, uh, that uh, that... For those who are destined for wrath, which is every one of us in this room at one time, um, that we are great, grateful, uh, grateful and uh, to a merciful God, that we remember that, and we pray that uh, if you've not um, been called or, or given faith in Christ, uh, that you would obtain that salvation, and only through Christ uh, this is the only way uh, to the Father. So that is the study, God's mercy. I hope that uh, it was helpful to you. Any questions, comments? All right, well, we're good. Yes? <laughs> All right, brothers. Thank you. God bless you. Let's, let's end in prayer. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this time that you've given, given us together. I pray that these uh, scriptures, Lord, would... Uh, would penetrate our hearts and our minds, and uh, and we would uh, contemplate them, Lord. Uh, not not the words that I've I've added, but only the true and uh, sure scriptures that have been read uh, from Your Word. That they would uh, they would accomplish the purpose in which You set them out. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen.